thanks very much. Uh, really good to be here and uh, participating today. Um, the last two years uh, have been tumultuous ones for Australian aid policy, as many of you in this ro room know more intimately than I do. Within three months of the election of the Abbott government, AusAid ceased to exist. And by 15 months into its term, three cuts, each more severe than the one before, had been made to the aid budget. These choices were especially remarkable because of what had come before. Journalist Graham DeBell has used the phrase, the golden consensus, to describe the decade-long boom in the Australian aid budget that was anchored by a bipartisan commitment to increasing our aid budget to 0.5% of GNI by 2015. During this golden decade, the budget grew by 7% per annum in real terms. With aid climbing from $3 billion in 2003-04 to a peak of $5.5 billion in the financial year prior to the election of the Abbott government. The spending decisions of the coalition have effectively erased the golden consensus, snapping the aid spending trajectory back to its long-term trend. Not so long ago, it was expected that our aid budget this year would be around $8 billion. Instead, it is half that. So the scale, scope and structure of Australia's aid program have all been changed at considerable speed. And although many of the substantial diplomatic implications of these changes are already apparent, some of the impacts will only be detectable with the passage of time. One thing that is certain is that the relative role of development in Australia's, di di in Australia's di diplomatic footprint has been diminished, especially outside our immediate region. While in my paper I consider how this is likely to shape Australia's diplomacy, in the limited time available to me today, I want to highlight something that has tended to pass unnoticed while changes to the scale and the structure of the aid program have grabbed the headlines. My contention is this. A central challenge for the future of Australian diplomacy is the need to improve the aid policy debate. In making this point, I want to try and convince you today of three things. That the debate needs to be improved, how the debate needs to be improved, and most importantly, why the debate needs to be improved. But before going any further, let me add two caveats. First, you might suggest that rather than simply applying to aid, the need to, or the imperative to improve the debate applies equally to foreign policy. I agree, and this was a theme that emerged strongly from last week's Australia 360 conference at the ANU, for example. But still, I think it's the case that the aid debate is uniquely marginalised, even within the limited foreign policy debate. Second, I acknowledge that the aid policy debate has improved quite markedly, especially over the last six or seven years. However, this improvement, while important, I think has just served to show just how much more improvement is required. So with those disclaimers out of the way, uh, what is it exactly that makes me suggest that the debate needs to be improved? My answer to this emerges from another question, one that the aid and development community has been too lenient in asking of themselves. And that is, why was it possible for the golden consensus to be uprooted so easily? The reasons, I think, are threefold. The consensus proved ephemeral in part because it was shallow, narrow and isolated. The shallowness of the consensus uh, was revealed when, at the first signs of fiscal stress, the consensus began to wither. The commitment to raising the aid budget held only during the easy days of the mining boom. The Abbott government was comfortable to repeatedly allow the aid budget to bear a disproportionate burden of the fiscal adjustments that needed to be made. Likewise, under Gillard, Labor repeatedly deferred or back-ended the 0.5% target, citing the tight fiscal environment. The consensus was also narrow in that it focused almost exclusively on aid volume. The overriding policy objective was to increase inputs to the policy area. Public campaigning was built on pressuring the government to spend 0.5%, and the increases in budget were achieved despite, rather than because of, effective arguments about rationale to increase aid. This narrowness of the debate ultimately proved a two-edged sword. The fact that the aid budget was widely known to have grown rapidly made it susceptible to being used as a high-profile symbol of a new government's willingness to make tough choices. In addition to being shallow and narrow, the consensus was isolated. The characteristic of the this characteristic of the golden consensus tells us about how aid 
the aid policy debate in Australia needs to be improved. The reasons for the rapid increase in the aid budget during the Golden Consensus were not sufficiently anchored within a broader discussion, understanding or agreement about the role in Australia's foreign policy, the role of aid in Australia's foreign policy. As a result, when fiscal storms appeared, aid policy was exposed as unmoored. There was no connectedness. The value of the aid program was not sufficiently appreciated by those outside the development sector, either by the policy-making elite, by politicians or the public. In the UK, as a contrast, the development community is not as siloed as in Australia. Many British development professionals have careers which encompass working at various stages for NGOs, for the media, advocacy organisations or think tanks, notably with the Overseas Development Institute or the Institute of Development Studies, or even as ministerial advi uh, advisors or parliamentarians. The community here is marked more by enduring cleavages. It is split into, split into pockets of academics, NGOs, development practitioners, private contractors and aid bureaucrats that rarely speak with a collective voice. Most notably, the Australian development community contains conspicuously few individuals who can capably cross over in the manner of their British counterparts, especially into the political realm. So the development community in Australia has not proven sufficiently willing or capable of engaging with the foreign policy elite who continue to bracket off aid policy. Recent books on Australian foreign policy are alike in playing scant attention to the contribution aid policy has made and potentially could make to Australia's engagement in the world. A deeply rooted reticent to engage in these debates about foreign policy exists amongst some members of the development community. I think partly this is explained by the persistence of a mistaken belief that to consider aid as a component of a state's foreign policy implies accepting that aid should be deployed exclusively to secure national interests. However, if such reticence continues, aid policy will remain outside the centre of Australia's future foreign policy vision, despite its comprising a sizeable proportion of our external expenditure. So this brings me to my third and most crucial point. Why is it that a, the aid policy debate needs to be improved? In short, it is because the quality of the aid policy debate will help determine the extent to which Australia is able to embrace the changing aid landscape. The nature of the development challenge has fundamentally changed. The process of negotiating the soon to be agreed sustainable development goals has demonstrated the extent to which the development agenda has expanded. The ethos which powered the Millennium Development Goals, the achievement of development outcomes largely via the provision of aid to poor countries from rich ones, has been superseded. Instead, development prospects will be determined by beyond aid issues such as trade, migration, tax, investment and technology policies amongst others. Increasingly, foreign policy is development policy. Thanks to globalisation, all aspects of a state's international interactions have development impacts. The core reason then that the aid policy debate needs to be improved is because development specialists will need to take responsibility for being drivers of policy coherence for development across government, whether directly or indirectly. In fact, it may well be that the capability of such individuals becomes a more powerful determinant of Australia's development impact than the size of our aid budget. As Owen Barter and Alex Evans recently argued in a submission to a recent UK parliamentary inquiry into the future of UK development policy, an effective beyond aid agenda depends on influencing and hence people more than on money. A core question posed by this inquiry was how well equipped is the UK Department for International Development to play development advocacy and advisory roles at the heart of government? This is a question the development community in Australia needs to ask of itself too. Likewise, we can ask, has Australia's integration into DFAT better equipped it to, play develop, it to play a development advocacy and advisory role at the heart of government? While there are some positive signs, there are some troubling ones too. Most worrying, I think, is the rate at which senior personnel with aid policy and management skills have left the integrated organisation. Yet also, over the medium to long term, the litmus test for Australia's commitment to policy coherence for development will undoubtedly be the South Pacific. 
It is the theatre where both the extent of Australia's willingness to make the transition from aid policy to development policy will be revealed and where the inconsistencies will be exposed. In the Pacific, Australia's beyond aid policies have outsized potential to impact regional development, both for good and ill. The government's recent steps to expand the Pacific Seasonal Worker Program and to work with Westpac Bank to lower the cost of remittances are pro precisely the sorts of beyond aid policies that can catalyse development. On the other hand, the priority afforded to climate change by the current government is out of sync with the priorities of Pacific, Asian, Pacific Island nations. Earlier we heard Professor Maley as well talk about some of the inconsistencies our, migra our stance with migration can have in, the, in this region in particular. So increasingly our soft power will be impacted by the way we manage the trade-offs between our domestic and international priorities and the development and economic objectives of our foreign policy. The way we initiate and contribute to collective action to address transboundary risks and global public goods will significantly determine our future standing in the world. So to conclude, over the past two years, we've seen the crowding out of development in Australia's diplomacy. This serves to underscore the missed opportunity during the Golden Consensus to embed development policy more deeply into the way Australia engages internationally. Yet it is precisely because the Beyond Aid agenda is so dependent on dialogue and advocacy to drive development outcomes that it is more imperative than ever to improve the quality of the development policy debate in Australia. Thanks.